A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, I'm Victoria Meyer, host of The Chemical Show. This episode is being recorded with a live audience, which is a first for us. Um, And so there may be some questions from that audience. So you'll hear them. They'll submit them through me. And in fact, I hope we do get some uh, questions. Um, And so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Thank you to all of the folks that are joining us live today and to those who are listening to the recorded podcast. Um, Appreciate having you guys as part of the Chemical Show community and the chemical community. So if you want to be part of a future live episode um, and get to interact directly with our podcast guests, um, visit thechemicalcommunity.com to sign up, to be a member and get access to these events and more. So great. Today, I'm speaking with John Richardson of ICIS. John is an expert in China, the Middle East and chemical markets and probably a few other things. Um, And if you follow John on LinkedIn, you know that he has really strong insights and a point of view on supply demand of petrochemicals. Uh, And writes a lot about polyethylene and polypropylene in particular. um, And he's not afraid to share those points of view. So today we're gonna be talking about China's policies, including clean air and common prosperity. Um, and the impact it has on petrochemicals globally. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Victoria. So glad to have you here again. Let's just take a look back at 2021. What stood out for you in the world of petrochemicals and plastic supply and demand? Well, focusing on China, um, we should go back to 2020, first of all, which was quite a remarkable year because obviously it started very badly for China. Then whoosh from... (laughs) From May onwards, they were supplying all the stuff we needed during lockdowns in the rich world. You know, the TVs, the refrigerators, the office furniture, the game consoles. And there's a huge boom in Chinese petrochemicals demand. So it's China in, China out. So we have big rises of polyethylene, polypropylene imports, polypropylene being the bigger re-exported product um, that made its way into finished goods re-exports. And that really supported a very strong unusually strong growth at a time when there's a lot of, new, of Chinese capacity going online. Yeah. So I always felt that like last year would be, you know, a little bit more subdued, you know, and things would come off that high. And you need to compare with pre-pandemic 2019 as well, of course, to be sort of realistic. But what I didn't see, I don't think anyone saw, was this common prosperity shift. We knew it was around. We didn't know they were going to take it that seriously. And that was really from August onwards. And this is the big change, both environmentally and for supply and demand fundamentals, which has contributed to probably negative growth of polyethylene last year. It's a factor. Polypropylene remained positive, but it was lower than people had expected because polypropylene is more driven by that tremendous export trade that carried on booming last year. Um, and it's really, you know, it got major short and long term implications for the global industry. Because China, as you know, Victoria, totally dominates global demand. Yeah. Um, You know, way ahead of the US and Europe now from 2009 onwards. And it's the biggest, as everyone knows here on this call, it's the biggest import market for so many chemicals and polymers. Yeah, it is interesting. So um, I think let's just start unpeeling some of that. So if I think about um, what I heard and saw going on, let's just say in the third and fourth quarter, we were hearing a lot about electricity and maybe energy rationing in China, resulting in plants having to shut down, cycle production. Was that a common prosperity thing? Was that something else? And what was the Yeah, well, it was that and other things. So what happened is that the central government said, my goodness, the provinces are not hitting their carbon emissions reduction targets under the the five-year plan that was coming towards an end. So um, they, you know, increased the restrict, you know, the, the requirements of the provinces. 
this occurred as when Australian coal imports were being practically banned because of the political dispute with Australia. And at a time when Indonesian coal supplies were, were falling, major um, exporters to China because of weather. So it was a kind Got of it. perfect storm, if you like. But, you know, what the Chinese government did very quickly was fix that. So if you talk to the market in early November, they said by the end of November, it will be fixed. So it was fixed. Um, okay. And now, you know, coal economics for chemicals are very good. In fact, better than that through economics. Yeah. And coal supplies back to normal. But it, it is an important sign that we'll get lots of disruptions um, between central government and local government as they roll out this common prosperity um, policy shift. Yeah. How much of that was linked to air quality? So I know we've got the Olympics starting up. In fact, when this podcast actually gets published, the Olympics will have just started. And I know we've seen in the past shifting of where manufacturing sites, sites are, some shutdown of certain facilities to help make the air cleaner, frankly, for big events. How big of an think, impact did that have? I think in terms of the coal shortages, that was more of the carbon emissions issue. Although yeah. in wind, the coal, coal air quality does worsen because of the, the coal issues and the still and cold air. But mm. on, on to the Winter Olympics, absolutely. Um, we're going to see factories closing if they haven't already. They've got to create clean air um, for, the, for the Winter Olympics. And so that will cause some supply chain issues, um, you know, for the chemical yeah. industry around the Winter Olympics. That They have to go off smoothly. Yeah. I mean, everybody's watching them and it's already under pressure because of COVID and yeah. either athletes not participating. I just saw that some of the news reporters, the sports reporters aren't going to be on site. So I think that's a, a big impact. So what else about, you know, let's just talk cleaner policy in general. What, what is it and how is it affecting petrochemicals? Well, very good question. <laughs> how long is a piece of string? <laughs> Scenarios here. <laughs> I mean, you talk to people in China, you read everything you can get your hands on and then, you know, see opinions, opinions. It all depends on how the government applies its policies. But the feeling is that they're deadly serious about this, right? Mm. That they really, really want to hit those international com commitments for geopolitical reasons, you know, geopolitical gain over the US. Um, and then we go into air, soil and water quality. There's big improvements in air quality for the last 10 years, but soil and water still lag behind. And that's a firm political commitment to the people of China. There's that. So before I explain what it means for petrochemicals, you ought to say why it's in, why another reason it's important for China, and that's the aging population. So that gets on to um, SAPs, huh. actually. <laughs> yeah. Demand to Kimberly Clark. Um, you think about you know, rising wage costs that China needs to move up that manufacturing value chain to justify the higher wages in those coastal rich provinces. You know, it's not the same in other parts of China. That's a manufacturing heartland. So the way to do that is green industries, environmentally, you know, ah. advanced industries, uh, and combined with which also is cleaning up plastic waste as carbon and plastic waste. Um, and there is an argument to be made that, you know, Chinese funding is enormous for, for innovation. You know, massive number of new patents coming in and innovation. Right. And you can argue that they will go for this in a huge way. Um, and do you and think their focus is, is, is their innovation focus in on green and uh, low carbon technologies? Or do you see yeah. that kind of across the, yeah. the landscape? I mean, across the landscape, we talk specifically about chemicals, and so the people that talk talk to this about this in the big, you know, big chemical companies, they say, "Don't be surprised if China leads the way on electric furnaces, crackers, for example, you know, built on renewable energy, of course." Um, don't be surprised if they lead the way on green and blue hydrogen, if that ever works. Mm. On carbon can, other issues around that, and carbon capture and storage, and that. BSF are building this low carbon cracker at Nanhai, you know, another cracker which is supposed to be the lowest carbon crackers in the world, beating a gas cracker in the US by a long way. Mm. And, um, How is it low carbon? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think he's thinking, not quite sure that there is um, 
there's been some stuff on the BSF website about the technologies. Right? I forget, I'm afraid, but um, yeah, okay. it's all explaining to you. It's 40% and now lower than standard cracker. That's what I've been told. Yeah, that's um, significant. Um, it's around the cracker process. It's around the cracker process that they're, you know, saving carbon. Um, you know, and so therefore they'll be inviting in those technologies and developing them locally. Um won't necessarily mean that they will slow down petrochemicals investment drastically because it's important to know that another feature of their policy direction is something called dual circulation, which is greater self-sufficiency from commodity imports. Um, hmm. I think they'll be more selective. Uh, you can argue that coal to chemicals may struggle to get approvals. That's the general view. We've seen a declining share of coal to chemicals in the capacity mix. Because of the carbon impact? Yeah, and the dirty air. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's both the particulate stuff in local communities and the carbon issue as well. It's very yeah. carbon intensive. Yeah. So then how does, let's close this loop, how does clean air affect petrochemicals? You would think, and again, this is speculation, you know, come on, we, we don't know what the Politburo really thinks. and be very arrogant yeah. to suggest that, of course. And this is what's been discussed widely in the industry. Europe's introducing carbon, well, talk about introducing carbon border adjustment mechanisms, right? Yeah. So if you're importing, eventually, if it does kill the petrochemicals, that's the plan eventually, I think. If you're importing polyethylene from the United States, then what's the carbon impact of that polyethylene versus mm. local plants that have to be very carbon conscious and carbon efficient? Why on earth wouldn't China do that as well at some point? If it's, so you, if it's decarbonizing its industry, that's 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 the yeah. theory long term. Yeah. Okay. So decarbonizing it to low carbon technologies inside the country and getting higher carbon ones elsewhere, or just being net neutral on it. Exactly, and then okay, you know, there's issues around how carbon intensive is plastic recycling. That's another story altogether, isn't it? One can argue yeah. it's worth the virgin, and I would argue that. But you can also see a significant recycling industry building in China. Again, the idea I've been told is that they develop technologies they can export. So they lead okay. the way in these technologies. They license them overseas. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so what's um, what? How about common prosperity? Let's switch over to that because um, that seems to be having a significant influence right now. You know, what is it really, and and what's the impact? What do we see happening as a result of that in in plastics or petrochemicals? We've actually covered it. I mean, common prosperity includes this environmental push. Ah, so okay. It's so it's all part of it. Common, yeah, sorry, I should have explained. Apologies. Yeah. It, it, common prosperity in, in, in about cleaning up the environment, hitting those carbon emissions, and connects to which is the aging population, moving up that, you know, dealing with it. The other aspects of common prosperity, let's start with the property bubble. So Post-2009, you look at these extraordinary demand patterns where whoosh, China's share of global demand took off for all the petrochemicals and polymers. And you can do a correlation with that takeoff and the rise of total social financing or credit in China. It's pretty close. So you have this property boom mainly centered in the 10 richest provinces where you see the highest rates of consumption growth. So it's obviously directly linked to the property sector, but indirectly through conspicuous consumption. So China, in under common prosperity, has said, well, Xi Jinping said in 2017, houses are, houses are for living in and not for speculation. Now, people thought, ah, yeah, he's just saying that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got the whole Evergrande thing, right, which has been speculating yeah, yeah. for a while, right? So, yeah. Exactly. But it was early August when he said, hmm, we're going to let Evergrande fail. Well, it, no, that's not right. We will let the big Evergrande investors fail. Right. So there's no suggestion Evergrande will completely go belly up. It would be possibly subject to a state rescue, almost nationalized with the smaller investors being OK. Now to social hmm. stability, but the big investors will take the hit. And that was a really big turnaround from August. People thought that would never be allowed to happen because of the size of, as you know, yeah. the debts. And it's a sign that they call the three red lines they've introduced since August, which is credit restrictions on, on the developers. Um, and it means there's less credit available and the government wants to deflate that 
property bubble for common prosperity reasons. A, because it's created too much debt. There are too many empty apartments in those richer provinces. And this is where we get on to another aspect of common prosperity. It has created greater wealth inequality within China. We talked about this, I think, before. The Gini coefficient in the China is worse than the US. So you have huh. extremely rich people in those 10 rich provinces, and a lot poorer people as you move further west and up to the northeast Rust Belt. And they want to, under common prosperity, create more even economic growth across the country. Um, so, you know, let's deflate the property bubble. Let's raise the tax base. Um, and the reasons for that, well, the tax base being raised will create more pensions, health care payments to do with an aging population and more money to be invested in the other provinces of China. Um, and a key part of raising the tax base could be, I'm not saying it's happened yet, a nationwide property tax. It's only in that, Does that exist in, today or no? It's been trialled in cities such as Shanghai. So okay. you, you may see that. And of course, there's resistance to this, obviously. Right. Um, a big problem is this merry-go-round where this is, this is a dilemma for China. 89% of funding, government funding for pensions, healthcare, et cetera, comes from the local governments, the provincial authorities, 89%. Their main source of spending is selling land to property developers. Wow. So go figure. And they've been able to raise the levels of spending because the value of land has been going up. And this is where you get all this confusion between central government targets and provincial government objectives which is the coal, is, a, is an example of how things can go wrong and have to be fact fixed in the short term. Yeah. So you get lots of backwards and forwards on these policies. But it, it seems they're deadly serious um, about sticking with common prosperity because the old economic growth model doesn't appear to be working anymore. You, and so is, is common yeah. prosperity kind of a Robin Hood policy uh, in some respects, like it tax the rich to equalize to the poor? I mean, is that effectively what's so, happening I hate to use a word but it's socialism yeah um it is that yeah um and that's you know you talk to people like michael pettis who's done some excellent stuff on this the the beijing based economist and there's been a lot of resistance um to that approach and is it resistance just in the rich provinces or is it widespread um i think anybody who's skin in the game's doing well, yeah, you know, okay. um, um, including the state and enterprises as well. That's another issue that doing well from the current system. Yeah. Um, so, so how yeah. does this, yeah. So, so let's, let's take this back a little bit. And I know I've, I've seen some of your writings recently um, on LinkedIn, cause I, you, you like to publish your points of view there, which I think is a good place. Um, so the real estate bubble, the real estate, bubble, I guess, um, it drove a lot of plastics demand and petrochemical demand as a result mm -hmm. of consumption, building, et cetera. So what happens with common prosperity? Does this imply a pretty dramatic decrease in demand or a leveling out? Or what do you see happening? I don't think demand will decrease. Um, I think it could potentially grow a lot slower. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I published a chart on the blog um, I think last week, where I looked at our polypropylene per capita demand forecasts for China out until 2032, and it's a straight line going up. Huh. Yeah, and it actually overtook the US a few years ago, which when you think about it, of course, China's a lot poorer country than the US. A lot of that to do is re-export to polypropylene, as I said. But you can make the case that the, the rate of growth will slow down from, say, 4 or 5% per year, which is our base case. I mean, the U.S. polypropylene per capita will grow by 1% in 2032. Mm. Now, it's a very mature economy, of course, the U.S., and that's what you would expect. But maybe China's going to grow less, um, I would contend, for A, because of the property bubble deflating, B, because of the challenges of raising wealth in those poorer provinces. Now, something else that's important is that they really want to do that. They want to create a more equal country, as I said. But the poorer provinces are older than the richer provinces because all the young people, a lot of the young people, rather, have moved to the coast over the years for the jobs. 
Sure. And as we know, in spending patterns, older people buy less stuff and generate less demand. So you need scenarios. Um, you know, and I think there's a scenario where, say, polypropylene demand grows more like the U.S. I wouldn't say it'd be as low as the U.S. out to 2032 mm -hmm. and beyond. And then you, you start calculating what that means for global demand, and it's a lot smaller than than most assumptions. But I don't think demand will decline. Okay, and we've seen a lot of investment, or you know, um, you know, right now there's some plants starting up. It seems like all around the globe we continue to see investment. So, do you see investment just keeping at pace with where it's been? Is there any reason to suggest it wouldn't? I think that the issue is what the plant wants to do where you're building it, and if you're building a polypropylene plant to export to China, think again, because, because China's becoming independent on polypropylene. In particular, that's another issue of dual circulation. So you've got lower demand growth and you play around with our data. Now, this was impossible three years ago. So you look at the ICIS data and you make not unreasonable adjustments to our base case and operating rates in demand growth. And suddenly you're into a net export position over the next few years. Yeah. You don't have to make ridiculous adjustments. Not saying that will happen, but it could happen. Uh, but what's mm -hmm. certainly true, even under our base case, that imports are declining. Um, so think again, if you're building a polypropylene plant, if you're building a polypropylene plant to export to other big markets, like, you know, Turkey is a big market, Asia Pacific, you might be all right, but some 40% of global net imports of polypropylene go to China. So that's a big chunk lost, isn't it? Potentially. There's a lot. Um, yeah. depends the focus of that investment, I think, Victoria. Yeah. Mm, interesting. And what about polyethylene? There's less, less of, less of, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, less go ahead. At risk. Yeah, I mean, HD is the big one uh, because of the size of China's capacity additions. Um, potentially, you could see imports dropping to about 5 million tonnes this year from 6.4, 6.9 last year and 9 million tonnes the year before. Yeah. But I think over time, that self-sufficiency might edge down a bit, right? So even, you know, especially if they start building more selectively. Do, do you think uh, there's a drive towards uh, self-sufficiency in the long term, especially when we think about maybe the green technologies and the, the circularity of plastics in particular, which is obviously getting a lot of focus? Um, is that realistic? Is that the plan? Uh, yeah, again, it's getting inside the mind of the public bureau, but. When you look at the policy doc, and I mean, the thing you can say that when China says it's going to do something, it normally does it, right? Yeah. So from, from the level of looking at the policy details, they say we want to be much more self-sufficient. We started, we started the process in 2014, and they've got there with polypropylene. They're close with styrene, and they're getting there with high density. But as I say, that's a short-term challenge. But, and the answer, sorry, short, is yes. There's a potential that, across the, the board that could become much more self-sufficient in, in, in the future years. <clears throat> but certainly in the medium term, products like glycols, paraxylene, there's no risk. Okay. Then you low and low, there's no major risk. It's all about the polypropylene. And the styrene, yeah, I and would say. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So what, do we, what should we be looking out for um, here in 2022? Um, what would be our early indicators of, of anything, any dramatic changes or, you know, what do you see uh, in the horizon that we should be paying attention to? Reflation of the property bubble. And some of these signs are being easier on the developers. <clears throat> and then we're, you know, the merry grow round probably starts a bit again. They may does, ref panic. does reflation yeah. of the property bubble increase demand? Yeah. Okay. It, would, it, would, it would boost conspicuous spending. Um, it would put the local authorities in a temporarily better position to meet their obligations, you know, for all that financing. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the Xi Jinping, there's a big political meeting in October and November where Xi Jinping is due to be confirmed for the third term of office because they're changing the rules. Normally they have to step down after two terms. And it might be that if growth is struggling ahead of that key meeting, then they will relax. Got um, I should mention, as you mentioned it already, of course, COVID, zero COVID. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's that, the, the, the feeling is, and again, do we really know, but the, the, the feeling is that 
zero COVID will certainly stay in place till the Winter Olympics are over. We don't want that to be disrupted in the same way clean air. And probably till that political meeting takes place. And you can argue that that's a negative for growth because, of course, it's affecting economic activity. The huge Lunar New Year spending season may be negatively affected. So it's not really the, the theme, but also it's affecting supply chains as well um, around port disruptions. Yeah. I mean, so so let's talk about the supply chain a little bit. I mean, it's, it, I, I almost feel tired talking about supply chain, and yet I think <laughs> it's still really disrupted. Am I right? And I mean, what are you seeing from from where you sit? I mean, I hear a lot about uh, empty containers at ports, and that may be a U.S.-specific phenomena. Um products not getting shipped in the, you know, the crazy inflation uh, and increase in rates, um, the competition um, for cargoes, for cargo space between chemicals and consumer products and other stuff. Um, You know, what are you seeing and and do you see any changes this year? All that above. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I I had thought only, two weeks ago, that maybe things would ease up a bit after the Lunar New Year holidays, which finish on Feb 6. Yeah. Um, but it like, looks unlikely now because zero COVID, the ports themselves in China, those critical ports like Ningbo and Dalian and Shanghai, and Ningbo and Dalian are where some the hotspots for COVID have not been disrupted directly yet, I don't think, but the trucking deliveries to the ports have been affected by the lockdowns. So this is, as you know, Victoria, this is a huge ripple effect around the world and China being so important for, you know, for um, distribution of stuff, especially by a container vessel. Um, and I think, you know, what we've got this weird situation in polymer markets where you've got really fantastic margins that come off recently in the US and Europe, but all-time yeah. high and all-time low margins in, in Asia, Um HD, again, was the lowest. The ICI's data for last week was the lowest on record, but it's negative for two hundred a ton. Um, and so that's, I mean, the US and Europe have been protected from Asian surpluses by the issue of containers. And sometimes it's not just the cost. I mean, actually, the cost still works because of these record high, you know, differentials sure. and pricing. But you just can't get them. Well, customers are not prepared to wait. Yeah. So I had thought that might ease. I think probably not for a while. Probably maybe the second half of this year, the earliest, we'll see some relaxation. The, the issue that I – sorry, again, it's off the, the subject. The issue I mm. keep coming back to is inflation and demand destruction. At what point do people stop buying all this stuff? These, these, these yeah. Are good. So when is that going to happen? I mean, we're seeing – pretty high inflation, certainly US, Europe, I think around the globe. So when are, when are people going to stop spending? Well, the, the old argument that I've seen from a few economists is when um, oil prices are more than 3% of GDP, you get recessions historically. Of course, this week, the uh, highest since 2014, so that's well above 3% of GDP. Mm-hmm. The reports in the US that you know consumers are backing off, if you look at some of the data, not all of the data, some of the data. I think it's probably started already, you know, because things are just so expensive, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything's gone up. I mean, if you just walked your local grocery store, you see a dramatic change in pricing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So, so, so inflation is likely yeah. to impact demand this year, potentially. I think so. Um, it has done historically. Uh, and the other thing as well that we were discussing just before this podcast, weren't we, that how will demand look if the pandemic becomes endemic, right? So people stop spending as much on computers and laptops. And anyway, you only buy a computer once every in a while, don't you? There's also a circuit, you know, there's yeah. a sort of, um, decline, you know, you bought that refrigerator, you're not going to buy one again for a while. And But people then spending more on services, whether that will then also take pressure away from container space. Uh, hmm. That could be, right? Yeah, I mean, I think moving from big, hard good, white good type purchases to services and consumables might shift that. I think so, yeah. Hard. I mean, hard to say. Although I will say the availability, my sense of it is that availability of products that had been hard to get for over the past 18 months 
has eased. And whether oh, that's a manufacturing yeah. thing or a, you know, manufacturing as in it's finally catching up, whether it's just a supply demand curves meeting up um, appropriately, it does seem to, it seems to be easier to get the things that were long lead times for a period of time. Dishwashers, refrigerators, you know, all those various things that people started investing in uh, during the, the pandemic. Yeah. So one more thing. I read somewhere this week that the um, that the Los Angeles and Long Beach port contracts for the, for the workers are due for renewal in July. Oh. And last time that happened, there was industrial action. So. Oh, interesting. That, that well, might. and it's. And it seems like they, uh, the workers may actually have uh, more power at the moment, right? Right, to, okay. To demand, I mean, if that's the case, right? If it, there's such a tightness at those ports, um, it seems like it would be favorable to the workers that they would have more power in those negotiations. Yeah, I didn't realize how important those ports are until recently. They're hugely important. Hugely, yeah. 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 I mean, I, we're, uh, the U.S. has been trying to develop other ports and has, but... Long Beach and Los Angeles continue to be uh, really critical for the um, uh, traffic coming from China, et cetera. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, good. Well, John, this has been really good. I appreciate you joining us today and uh, covering a whole variety of topics. Um, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to get hold of you? Uh, John. Link- dot Richardson. Oh, LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn. Sure, LinkedIn and- yeah. Yeah. Or, or Our, your email. Uh, yeah, I was going to say john.richardson at ICIS.com. Perfect. Awesome. And um, I hope uh, I hope you guys that have been listening have enjoyed this episode of the Chemical Show podcast. Please subscribe, um, follow, and share it with your friends and colleagues. And we will see you again soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. All right. Thanks, Sean. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.